This third video in our series for t-test takes up the concept of effect size and also looks at how we actually go about reporting our results. In our textbook, effect size is a separate module that comes really quite late in the course, way back in the 30s. However, that's a poor place to put it because effect size applies to each of the tests that we do. So if we waited until that module to look at effect size, we would have to go back and relearn how it applies to each of the tests that we have done along the way. So instead, I've brought that material forward in your assigned reading, and we have um, this lecture, and we'll have little bits in the lectures moving forward, so that when we get to that module, you will already have dealt with the concept several times, and it will be part of what you already know. So let's dig in. The notion of effect size contrasts with the notion of significance. When we say that we found a significant results, what we're really saying is that the sample that we analyzed, or the samples, plural, that we analyzed, have results that are unlikely to have occurred by random chance if the null hypothesis is true. But that doesn't tell us whether the difference that we found between the two groups, or later between the three groups, is large or small, and it certainly doesn't tell us whether the difference is meaningful. One of the truths about significance testing is that when we have a large sample, it makes it easier and easier to find a significant result. If you think about the standard error for your one sample t-test, which is the easiest one to think about, you have the variability of the sample on the top of the equation, but on the bottom you've got the square root of n. So if the sample size n goes up to 100 or 200 or 400, as it gets larger, that standard error gets smaller. And when the standard error gets smaller, your t result, where the standard error is in the denominator, gets really quite large, even though the actual gap between the two means may not have changed at all with that change in sample size. So the effect size calculation is giving us a different way of looking at the clinical or the meaningful level of importance once we have found that the two groups, or later three or more groups, differ uh, significantly, then we can say, well, is that difference actually meaningful to us? Cohen's d is a measure of effect size that only is applied to t-tests. You can see from its equation that it's taking the gap, or the difference between the two means, as the numerator, and then dividing it by the standard deviation of the differences. Notice that that's not the standard error, but the standard deviation. So it's expressing the gap between the two means in terms of the standard deviation. It's a little bit like a z-score, telling us how many standard deviations away from 0 this gap actually is. The classifications that we usually use for Cohen's d is that if we have a d of around 0.2, we call it a small effect. Around 0.5 standard deviations, we call it a medium effect. And a large effect is 0.8 standard deviations or more. Because of the nature of the equation, Cohen's d can be greater than 1. So there's no upper limit on what Cohen's d can be. Uh, what values it can take on. A second measure, one that we'll see in quite similar ways across many of the tests for the rest of the course, is r, or sometimes it's seen as r squared. It's uh, a measure of the proportion of the variability in the sample that's accounted for or predicted by the independent variable. Our equation over here for the t version of this statistic shows that we take the t statistic itself, which is showing us the gap or the difference between two groups 
in its top and adjusting that for the variability of the groups on the bottom. So we take that t-score and square it and then divide that result by the same thing, t squared, plus the degrees of freedom. So for a, a very small sample size, um, we'll find that we've got a value pretty close to 1. As the sample size gets larger and larger, the denominator will get bigger because those degrees of freedom are calculated from the sample size. And what we're seeing is the proportion of the variability that is explained or predicted, that's there in the t-score, adjusted for the sample size. Because of the nature of the equation, r and r squared, we've got, we have to take the square root to get to r, will never be greater than 1 because the degrees of freedom will always make the denominator slightly larger at least than the numerator. With r, when we have an effect of about 0.25, we call it a small effect. A medium effect is 0.25 to 0.40, and anything above 0.40 we would consider a large effect. And as I said already, it can never be larger than 1. So if anybody is ever reporting an r or an r squared greater than 1, you know they made a computation error somewhere along the way. Now that we know how to talk about effect size, we're ready to look at how we can write up the results of our tests. Our textbook does an excellent job of showing exactly how we report the statistical part of the results, but it doesn't tell us so much about how we would write up the entire narrative of the test, and that's what we'll be dealing with in this short section. We need to keep aware of doing our write-up with the readers in mind. And the readers are there because they're interested in the subject of the research, but to be honest, they are completely bored with hearing about how we carried out the actual statistical tests. So we want to write our report without mentioning our hypotheses or rejecting and retaining them or looking values up in a table or anything like that. Instead, we use the code word significant to reveal that we rejected the null hypothesis, and we use the phrase not significant if we failed to reject the null hypothesis. And aside from those code words and the actual statistical results, we try to write in something that is as close to narrative English, talking about the subject of the research, as we possibly can. I usually encourage people to use a sandwich method to write a paragraph. In the sandwich method, the paragraph opens with a plain English sentence, something that anybody could understand even if they really had never studied statistics. Mostly it would be telling them that the, what the question was that we were studying and also how the research was carried out. And I also close the paragraph with a plain English sentence so that my non-statistical reader is going to leave with a sense of meaning. And between those two pieces of narrative English that serve as the bread in my sandwich, I put in all the numeric results in a nice standard order that makes good sense. I don't just cram them in there. And they're like the filling that goes in the, san in the sandwich. So let's see what that looks like in actual practice. Before I actually begin writing, I like to organize and gather my statistics. I'm usually going to have to have some descriptive statistics, such as the mean and standard deviation of each group or sample, and the number of cases, so that I can write up um, a description of the group that was involved in the study. And then I need my inferential results from the statistical test itself. Right now, the only test that we have actually worked with is the t-test, but we'll be working with analysis of variance that yields an f. We'll be dealing with chi-squared. It looks like the uh, chi-square letter did not come through on this slide and other uh, values besides those. So we'll always be reporting the test statistic, the degrees of freedom, and the actual p-value when we have it. 
if we're re reporting results based on a critical value in a table where we, all we could do was see whether our test statistic was larger than the critical value, we can't report an exact p-value. Instead, we just report p less than 0.05 or p less than 0 0.01, whichever alpha level we used in choosing our critical value. And whenever we have a significant result, we include a measure of effect size. If there is no uh, significant result, then it means that we didn't detect an effect, and so we don't have to say anything about the size of an effect if there really wasn't one. So let's look at it with one of the examples from the textbook. Module 21 included an example of a sleep deprivation study where a group of research subjects were randomly assigned either to get a good night's sleep in the sleep lab on an air mattress or else to be kept awake all night so that they would be sleep deprived in the morning. And it even said the researchers would prod them gently if they started to fall asleep. And the actual thing that they were testing in the morning was the ability to memorize and recall semantically similar words. In other words, words that had similar meanings. So our descriptive statistics for this study show that the sleep group, the ones who spent the night sleeping on an air mattress, could recall on average a little more than 40 words with a standard deviation of 3.5 four seven and all twelve of the subjects assigned to that condition completed the study. The group that had to stay awake all night um, was able to remember and learn thirty three words on average with a little bit more variability, four point oh, and it's important to note that in this group only nine of the twelve remained in the study. Some people had to be dismissed or fell asleep um, uncontrollably and were dropped from the study. Also in the example in Module 21, we saw the actual T statistic, 4.170, and the degrees of freedom was 19. You can see that 12 plus 9 would give us 21, minus 2, because we lost one degree of freedom for each of the two means that we computed. I needed to go to Excel and use the function that you see in our Excel homework for this week to get the p-value exactly that goes with the t of 4.170. And that exact p-value is really quite small, 0 0.0026. So our decision based on that p-value, when we see a p less than 0.05, we reject the null hypothesis, so that was our decision. Given that we rejected the null hypothesis, I computed the effect size r, found it to be 0.691276, which meant that I have a large effect in this study. So overall, I can begin to see that the group that was sleep deprived, did not remember as many meaningfully uh, similar words as the other group did. Now let's see how I write that up in a narrative format for my readers. In putting together this paragraph, I used blue for the parts that were the bread, the narrative sentences, and then I put my numeric quantitative results in black. So you can see that my first sentence is describing the subject matter of the study. This would let my reader decide whether she wanted to keep reading or not. So I am say the impact of sleep deprivation on recall errors for semantically related words was tested with a group of 24 volunteer subjects, half of whom were randomly assigned to stay awake all night. The control group slept. I used as much of the language of the description of the study as I could. As soon as you start to change the words to mean what, to express what you think they mean, you may in fact stray from the actual research situation. So as much as possible, 
Even though sometimes the sentences are lengthy and a little bit tedious, we use the exact language of the research. I made sure to include the random assignment because that's a key element for being able to talk about causation after I've analyzed my results. In the next sentence, I say that three subjects were dropped from the awake condition. I don't need to explain why, although if I wanted to be somewhat lengthier, I could, but I do want the reader to know that not all 24 of the subjects remained in the study. Then I get to the part where I'm going to report my numeric results. So instead of just putting in a table of the mean and standard deviation, which is sometimes done, especially if there are a lot of variables being tested, but I chose to write a narrative sentence, and I said, the subjects who slept recalled about 40 words, and then I put in the mean standard deviation and sample size for that group while those who kept awake remembered about 33 words, again followed by the mean standard deviation and sample size. The difference was significant. There's the result of my hypothesis test in the code language. And then just as the textbook has been teaching us to do, I put in the T statistical information. So it's the letter T to let the reader know exactly which test I used, 19 to let them know what the degrees of freedom were, my actual T value, followed by the actual P value that I got from Excel. And in this situation, I included the phrase one-tailed because the usual way of doing the T test is a two-tailed test unless it's specified otherwise. I went on to say that the effect size was large and chose to report my R value. I'm a fan of R more than I am of Cohen's D because it's a concept that remains similar across several of our tests. So having reported all of the quantitative results, I'm now going to sum up with a sentence that would let a reader know what I found out even if she was not able to understand what I had written. So I say, a night of sleep deprivation markedly reduced the subject's ability to memorize and recall words with similar meanings. So you can see with clarity that the textbook has given you the exact way to use APA format for the text of the specific results, but actually writing up your results involves writing a full narrative paragraph that conveys the entire meaning. This is the end of the lectures for week four. You should be ready if you have not already tackled the Excel assignment. You should be ready for that. And after reviewing the material in the textbook, you'd be ready to tackle the quiz as well. Good luck.